The Spin-Off Podcast Network. We believe where you live shouldn't decide your destiny and that any place can be a place of learning. So much of modern life has a handy home delivery option. Why not your education? Maybe you'll start your degree in the same space you share with your Fano, or from that corner of the spare room that catches the most sun. Start your new what at the place where we're can be anywhere, online or on campus. Massey, New Zealand's leading online university. Apply now at massey.ac.nz. Without foresight or vision, the people will be lost. Kia ora koutou, I'm Stacey Morrison. No mai, haere mai, welcome to Conversations That Count, Ngā Kōrero Whaitake, a thought-provoking series brought to you by Massey University and the spin-off. In this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Krishal Wātene from Massey University and Alex Hawea from the Southern Initiative and Auckland Council for a conversation about the ways in which Mātauranga Māori has grown and evolved over the years and how it can and should lead the way for Aotearoa in a time where transformation is more necessary than ever. Dr. Wātene is a senior lecturer in Massey's Department of Philosophy. She specialised in moral and political philosophies of well-being, development and justice, with a particular focus on Indigenous philosophies. Alex goes by the title Social Entrepreneur and has worked in fields ranging from education to social work and has a particular focus on applying Indigenous approaches to innovation. Nō reira tēnā kōrua. thank you both so much for joining us. Tuatahi nei. Crystal, I wonder if you could please explain your mahi and how you came to it, especially because I'm interested as to why you have made this focus, because there's so many areas to work on. Uh, kia ora, Stacey. Um, thanks for having me. So I'm a, a philosopher at Massey, and I'd say that I fell in love with philosophy when I took my first course at the University of Auckland many years ago. And it was being startled by this idea that we should challenge and undertake deep reflection of our most basic assumptions, uh, particularly around sort of living together, that really not only startled me, but really made me interested in the power of our ideas for changing the world Following that sort of um, that first course, I just I couldn't see the world in, in any other way. I mean, I have a particular uh, focus on Maori philosophy, and I call it that because I see it as a philosophical tradition in its own right. And I see that so richly in all my communities around the north that I belong to, in all the uh, kōrero that we carry, and in such unique ways across the Pacific. And I think it's such a beautiful space to be in. And I think there's so much, not only beauty, but so much usefulness for really trying to understand how you might live well together uh, going forward. And that's why I, I love philosophy, and that's why I love to do it with my communities, and that's why I love to see it in all the things that we do in all our practices and in all our land and seascapes. Kia ora. Kia ora. Is that something you have to explain a lot, that Māori philosophy, this is just another word for Fakaro Māori, isn't it? Philosophy. For a long time, um, there were sort of ideas. I mean, there's such rich philosophical traditions all around the world. That's one of the wonderful things. Uh, but for a long time, philosophy, the discipline of philosophy and the practice of it in universities was limited to Greek, to the Greek tradition only. And of course, Indian philosophy itself is, you know, much older, much older than that tradition. Um, so I think that's why I, I make a point of calling it Māori philosophy uh, for the work that I do. But it's more than that, right? There are many ways that we can that we do label it, and those are all in some ways richer because the the label that I use is is really um, about the discipline that I'm in and making space for Fakaro Māori in that discipline. Kia ora, because the labels do matter because the centering of story and mm. the valuing of Mātauranga is not usually set by Indigenous people when we're talking, say, in a university setting or in general acceptance of what is science. So then, Alex, can we talk about innovation from an Indigenous perspective and what you work on? My title is, is Social Entrepreneur with the Auckland Council. In that title, an entrepreneur, um, by our management's definition, is to be internally disruptive. So how do we disrupt the current ways of doing things and how do we find new normals in that. And it's really hard because a lot of the stuff you're brought up with 
in that whakaaro Māori is simply that philosophy that you organically, inherently have. And so to try and articulate that stuff, to put it down on paper so that others can pick it up as a practice or, or try and adapt that, can be quite a, a long process. But like what you talked about, you framed it around story. And we're really lucky. Like in our team, we have Elko Matua, our tohunga, um, Rediata Makiha. And sometimes it can be a half an hour quarter, and sometimes it can be a two hour wānanga with him. The way he'll sit and quarter or and share a karakia, for example, and then break down that karakia. And then you can use it either as a framework or even as a reflective tool on some of the mahi we've done. And so our, one of our flagship projects, it's quite uncanny because it's probably our most successful project we've had. I mean, that's our Amotai Supply Diversity Initiative that's going national at the moment, that supports Māori and Pacific-owned businesses into large supply chains and using smarter tactics around procurement to create long-term economic wealth for our people. And he use, quite often uses this karakia from the whare wānau or, or te hokianga, and it goes frame by frame through this karakia and talking about these old concepts from Hawaii and user navigation. When you put that karakia over the whakapapa of this kaupapa amotai, you can see the touch points through the entire of that mahi. Six months ago, I started to do the comparisons, and in doing so, you could almost track where we need to go next and begin to map that out. So it was really quite an enlightening experience, but quite practical as well. Because I think what happens is when we say mātauranga Māori, when we get into the Māori responsiveness space, you know, inside of Auckland Council, as you can probably imagine, the amount of kaupapa Māori things that we're now doing and this department's now doing and that sort of stuff, if it's done with the right intent, like tēnei kamihi, but to take it deeper to take it into a real place where you're working in partnership as opposed to consultation and stuff like that. And to move beyond, dare I say it, but to be disruptive again, move beyond the values. So how do we move beyond, take people from, oh yes, like the word kaitiakitanga and manakitanga are bashed across, you know, the public sector in particular. On one hand you have, that's really cool, they're starting to adopt these whakaaro Māori. But on the other hand is, are we losing the mana of some of those kupu in doing that? And how to, for me, mine is, is, okay, how do we take it to the next level? But yeah, there's this crossover of that deep mātauranga Māori is actually from thousands of years of observing the environment and research and research and research and research. That our tohunga were actually, they inherited, like, like academics, right? They've taken on a piece of research, synthesised it, tested it against their environment, and then come to those new conclusions or reinforce those previous ones. And for me, a lot of that has been lost. And so we need to try and, for the life of me, I'm going, our tohunga are ageing. How do we capture that? And like you say, it has <clears> been lost, but that's a nice way of saying it's been stolen, it's been minimised. Yeah. It has been removed from history. So, Krishal, is part of what we do when we embrace mātauranga Māori and the naturally innovative and philosophical frameworks that mātauranga Māori offers, are we actually returning to how we were before? Is that what our aim is? That's really interesting. I tend to hold the view that we are, but we're not. Um, and that's because I think there's something really powerful about mātauranga. And I just want to say, the, the other reason why I talk about Māori philosophy is because I think uh, there's a lot of kōrero around mātauranga and science, that it's just a science. And I think it's much richer, much deeper, much, much broader questions about everything in the world, not just scientific questions. Uh, so I think that's really important. But, I mean, if we think about the way in which these beautiful concepts have crossed the Pacific on these wonderful migrations and how they've had to be re-embedded into new landscapes and to deal with new challenges as they arise, there's this really this wonderful beauty of the way in which those concepts have travelled and yet retained something so beautiful, right, something um, really wholesome that we can still identify, right, that we can still trace this thread right around that migration. And so I think... We carry those threads, those key threads today, and we're, we're sort of reinvesting in them and we're trying to remember them and trying to recognise all the places that they've always existed, even if we might have forgotten or they might have been stolen from us. And then we have this wonderful opportunity to say, well, where do we carry those concepts to now? Right. Where do they take us from here? Because our tūpuna leave us these threads so that we can use them to go forward. And that's a wonderful thing. And that's what I think the beauty of mātauranga and the usefulness of it really is. So mātauranga Māori is fit for purpose in terms of innovation. I guess that's what I'm hearing from what you're saying as well. But Alex, then how much of your mahi is convincing, say, council 
or other entities that it's worthwhile and it's not just a everyone will feel nice kumbaya type moment. I think that's a journey we're still yet to take. There is still this, like you say, oh, it's a bit airy-fairy and wafty and we're not going to get any results. We have pretty hard evidence around that stuff in other fields, like education, for example. It hasn't been a perfect journey, but for Māori education, specifically from kohanga reo and progressing all the way to Farikura and whare wānanga, that the success rates for our people in a very short period of time, like I have to always point that out, people going, oh, well, it's not stuff back then, back then. Well, we've only been going five minutes. You guys have had 300 years at it, and it hasn't worked for three, so we've still got 299 to go. You know, so I think there's, there, there needs to be a parity of lens, the lens and factoring and everything that goes behind it, because I'd say that places like... Auckland Council, and this is being being cautious not to bite the hand that feeds me, but places like Auckland Council really like the results. When they see the hard results come out of it, that's when we get the, okay, we'll step back because what they're doing seems to be working. We can't put our finger on it, but it seems to be working. And the role of us in our innovation space is to test and try, test and try, test and try. If it fails, just make sure it fails fast because that's that's kind of at the heart of innovation. And for me, that speaks to that whole Maui mindset that you come in and you try and innovate and, and you take the responsibility. You bring all that knowledge you have and your experience and you try things. Is, is that failing fast and not costing too much? Is that yes, part of that's the expectation? Part of it. Yeah, that's part of the expectation, yes. And so then when we talk about parity of lens, we start to wonder about parity of payment how far away are we from that? I think we're still pretty far away from it, to be blunt. With Amotai referencing that mahi, social outcomes have been in tenders for a long, long time. It wasn't until my colleagues went in and said, you will use X percentage of this contract, we'll go to Māori and Pacific-owned businesses. The question is, how are you going to do this? As opposed to, give us a nice social outcome. You will employ this many people. What are the strategies you're going to do to employ these people from this community? And so... It has to take centre focus. If you want parity and you want to see those outcomes, it has to be required of people. Like, and, and I think that's okay to, to require that of the powers that be. Do you think that that is a fairly new requirement to ask this of people, to have higher requirements? Chris, I, I guess I look at the last, let's say, 10 years. How would you view the last 10 years in terms of acceptance of and mana given to Mātauranga Māori in wider New Zealand society? When I first came back from completing my PhD at St Andrews, I went straight into working with my own community um, of Ngāti Whāsuorake on their Fano Ora research project. And I thought that was just a wonderful initiative Mātauranga was so heavily involved and deeply embedded in that project um, and in that policy, in fact, and all the things that come out of it. And so I was really excited by the kind of steps that were being taken to kind of to think about policy in more kind of grounded ways, to not focus so much on kind of top down policies and treating people as passive or Māori communities in particular as passive recipients of pro- programs and, and policies, but actually saying, you know what? We might not understand it, but there's something, there are some really valuable insights into our ideas of well-being and health and to building community. And we, re- and we acknowledge that, you know, marae need support actually and need to kind of bring communities back together and to um, undertake practices because those are really valuable too. And there was this wonderful multidimensional approach grounded in mātauranga and I, was, I thought that was really exciting. It's interesting to me when we have these frameworks that become the latest thing in terms of business like say agile teams. To me that's how a marae works. Yeah. You have one agile team that's on the pipe by one agile team's in the kitchen. Yeah. So uh, you're going to pay people to tell you to do that? That's how we've been working for a very long time. Do you see that often? You're saying yep a lot. Oh, Alex. yeah, 100%. And this was one of our, our kaupapa. I went in and I've just come from out at, at Waititi and they've karakia morai once a month. The kids are doing these career things and they've birthed this kaupapa and it's won Prime Minister's Award, which is called Te Kete Uduau. And the tumuaki there, Papa Hare, he just sends the kids out into the world. Like he had a kaupapa around exercise and fitness. How do I get kids 
to not be intimidated by the CrossFit gym, the bodybuilding gym, the women's Pilates gym, whatever. So he's pushing kids into different places. And he's on, you know, as, as all education providers do, they're doing it off a smell of an oily rag. But then he's pushing kids into different career paths and doing like the gateway, but a real Māori way of doing it. Like, never mind this gateway framework, just throw that out the door. I'm just going to go out and do it, which has been beautiful. And I think it's the responsibility, and this is a challenge to myself to remember it and to other funders, we need to stop getting Māori communities to dance for their dinner. We should go out and see what they're doing and go, they already got this sussed. I need to learn how to frame that to meet this as opposed to get them to frame whatever they're up to to fit my new piece of research, my new way of operating because it's exactly what you say. The other side for Mātauranga Māori which saddens me is the constructs of our economy pull the rug out from underneath us that enables us to pursue Mātauranga Māori in so many ways. For example, we have one of the Amotai businesses, Ama Training Group. Now, they're not even a PTE, but the businesses use them because the owners and, and managers and deliverers all come What's from... What's a PTE? A oh, private training establishment. Right, sorry. sorry. It's all those acronyms yes. you use in oh, council. Yeah. yeah, don't get me started. And so they, they've gone in and done wānanga with companies that have 300 staff, 90% Māori Pacific, and when I was having a quarter with him afterwards, he, he used to be a tumuaki of a kurakaupa, but he said, Bro, our people are starved of mātauranga because they're busy working 60-hour weeks to just try and get kai on the table and a roof over their head. And so people come from the regions looking for mahi and they get sucked into this economic vacuum that fully disables them from being able to build that mātauranga into their world. And so he's looking at how do we enable that to go back into their world. I'm reminded of a kōrero that Sir Mason Jury offered at a Fano Order conference two years ago where he said, we don't ask what is the matter with this Fano, we ask what matters to this Fano." Mm. Krishal, would you say that this has been an issue and why we have some of the results we have for Māori in the past and currently is because we're looking at what's the matter with them rather than what matters to them. Totally. I mean, so these are fundamental questions about well-being or what you might call living well or flourishing, as Mason Jury so beautifully um, puts it. Yeah, I mean, the question that we ask is really important. I mean, that's if, if philosophy doesn't tell us anything else, it's that. The questions that we start with are, are so fundamental. And if we frame it that way, then we get a rich account, multi-dimensional account of well-being, all the different things that matter, that contribute to living well, and not just as individuals, but also as communities, which is, again, one of the beautiful things of Fano Order, but also things like wairua, right, and spirituality, the sorts of things that you, you just don't tend to find on other, historically, other ideas of well-being that have been sort of very kind of one-dimensional, very individual-focused um, very kind of top down, very lacking in any kind of rich conversation with people and their own lived experiences of well-being in their own lives and their own needs and aspirations in particular for themselves and for the people that they love. No kind of conversation about that at all. You're nodding. Uh, Alex, so that's something you see quite often is just that ability to be your full self at work and the space to be able to have an aspiration and be able to live it out. Yeah, a lot of the research within our team around the, the impacts of things like toxic stress, they, they are key inhibitors to our people living their best life, you know, as people like to say, like live, living, living it out, whatever mahi they're in, and bringing them whole, their whole selves to mahi. And when that toxic stress is so prevalent, that's when we see the impacts burst out in, in, in the extreme negatives of family violence, you know, substance abuse, and all the other things, you know, long-term unemployment, all those things that just start to unravel because they don't have the opportunity to be themselves and to do everything because of the stresses of, of, of life. And people freak out when you mention things like the Green New Deal because the Green New Deal is essentially placing people and the planet at the heart of every decision. Just about every quarter to until Māori is about people and the environment. You can't not have the two factored in and everything. And so if we're heading into, we're in recession at the moment, possibly head into a state of depression, which is a scary fact. We, none of us have lived through a depression, you know, like that, that era of people are gone. How could we rebuild our thinking 
and have my Tauranga Māori at the forefront of what we do. Because there it is in our kōrero tawhito, our whakatauke, our proverbs, moia, te ringa raupa, marry the person with calloused hands, tama noho, tama mate, tama tu, tama ora, so the boy who doesn't do anything is the one who will die, and yet we need to be busy and industrious. So we're not actually having to sell this to ourselves, are we, Krishul? The battle seems to be to actually be able to be Māori and exponents of mātauranga Māori. I mean, we, we do it all the time, right? Uh, you just need to go to a marae community anywhere um, and you see it happening. Yeah, and just, it's really interesting. So I sit on the UN Human Development Report 2020 Advisory Board and we have the same conversations. You know, people-centred development, imbalance with the planet. And the first thing, of course, I say is, well, this, this is where Indigenous philosophies begin there. Mm. Where, where we're trying to somehow now get to, right? So this it's is about, familiar. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's really about other people sort of undertaking some kind of sort of reflection uh, to acknowledge the the ideas that are already out there in the world that have been out there in the world all this time. Um, I think there is some kind of movement to see the the kind of usefulness and the existence of other ideas, other ways of thinking, and how actually. People share those views. People share the views of kind of that you find in, in indigenous communities all around the world anyway. Um, it's just that kind of, there's still a, a group of people who I think are just comfortable with the stories that they've been told and the stories that they are complicit with retelling for some reason. Validated by the fact it's written down and it's yeah. science. Those kind of things, Alex. You seem to be in agreement. Do you see that a lot? Ultimately, it comes down to the relinquishing of power. If I don't have power to control because it's not a construct that I'm familiar with, then you're wrong and I can't accept that. There's this polarising that's happened even in the political sphere that you're either a left or a right. And so, and for me, I was, you know, and you watch it this time of year, you're on social media and people are putting up photos of, this is what communism builds and this is what capitalism builds and blah, 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 blah. And I'm going, what if we just wiped it and you went and looked at what indigenous society looked like? then you're going to head into a place that's pretty awesome, I think. When you're looking at people in our whanaunga and in Te Whenua Moi Moia, they've been there for up to 40,000 years, living in a place where everything is trying to kill you. The weather's trying to kill you. The animals are trying, the insects, everything. And yet they have lived and thrived in that environment for 40,000 years. And if you miss it, that's Australia. That's all you say. Yeah, Yeah, we're talking about Australia. You go over to Hawaii, to our tuakana over there. And they have these fish farms that are based on feeding fish before you catch the fish. It's a simple concept. You feed them enough, they keep coming back. People don't want to relinquish that power in structures, but also in our relationship with nature and the environment. Normal can be very different. And I think some of our people are just happy to believe the normal story. You know, it was written down. So that's the way it must be, and it's always going to be. No one's willing to challenge or try something different. Crucial when we have that inner conflict of realising it is probably a relinquishment of power, and that doesn't feel good to many humans, mm. how can we embrace that? And I say we probably as tangata tiriti. How can tangata tiriti, as in people who are not Māori, and engage in Aotearoa in a way that is you know, built on the treaty relationship, how can we step into our discomfort if it feels like a relinquishment of power? Yeah, I think it goes back to um, actually what, what you said, Mason Jury said at that Whānau Water conference, which is, you know, what really matters to us? What does it mean to live well? And that's a question for all of us. And if we were honest about the answers that we gave about what it would take for us all to live well together, I think this, the solution would be quite clear, right? And that would be to celebrate community, to celebrate our relationships, to work in ways that um, sort of recognised each other as bringing something really valuable to kind of to a flourishing society, um, to to the richness of our, all of our lives, to protecting the planet. I think it would be so simple if we could just reflect on what really matters to us, actually, what would really contribute to us as living well uh, together in Aotearoa New Zealand, mm. but also globally. I think, too, like, that, that shift of mindset is required. Like, I was thinking, what's an example we could use? 
one, and it's a probably a, a bit shallow of an example, is I've been the driver in my whānau for how long? I can't wait for my kids to get the licence so I don't have to drive. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, sometimes it can be as simple as that. But it's an abundance mindset, right? There's, there's, this, there's this construct that's put on us is that mm. we do not have enough resource. There is plenty of resource if we share and the thing is the exponential growth that happens, uh, having an abundance mindset, that's the thing, right? The abundance mindset tells you to go out and feed those eka even though you're not trying to hunt them. The scarcity mindset, I need to keep this because I need it and right now for me and, and, and mine. And so being able to share and exponentially grows what you have. It means that when it is time to hunt, I go out, feed the eka, and I can take a few for us for the next week or so, or whatever. And so it's that shifting in mindset. And the only way, in my experience, people start to shift their mindset is having examples, like is their lived experience, and that's where that value of story comes in. Like you can put data on a piece of paper and you can argue over data and what it's saying and what it's indicating, but with our using Māori and Pacific owned businesses, with these big buyers, it's not until they have one, two, three, four good experiences with those businesses, and then they're all in. You know, we're gonna we're gonna do this differently. And so, it's a success by works or, or changing people by works and step at a time. But again, that comes back to that thing of we still have to keep fighting it all the time. That, that's kind of where it, where it sits with me. How we shift those mindsets. You know, it's that abundance thinking that we're not losing we're no. not um giving ground we're actually looking at an opportunity to step into our new zealand selves in a way that will be beneficial to all and it's interesting because tangihanga i think are a really good way of expressing how we've realized working together is beneficial to me it's our whole practices at Tangi are actually seated in a deep understanding of humanity and what people need emotionally and spiritually to be able to grieve in a healthy way that will actually help us ultimately. So, Crystal, what would you say that a healthy partnership relationship that has Mātauranga Māori as uh, something that matters to all of us could benefit and could offer us in Aotearoa? So many benefits. I mean, I think it provides different ways of thinking, new ways of doing things, it would rebuild communities for us, highlights the strength of our communities already. I should say it would lead to all the kind of developments that we find in New Zealand right now, like with the economy, on the sort of well-being agenda. All these things would be a massive benefit. We would be able to protect the environment. We'd be able to be vulnerable with each other. We'd be able to express ourselves in such new ways. We'd just have richer lives together. Um, and I think we'd be able to think about the way in which policies might reflect what really matters to our communities, all of our communities. And we would get an approach to policy and law that uh, really did celebrate what it is that matters to us and our lived experiences. And we'd be able to trust our communities more to do that work. And we would entrust them and empower them to be able to be capable of doing the work that we know that they can do. Because if, if Matauranga is anything, it's a wonderful journey and story of transformation and uh, great hope for the future. We do see that in times of crisis, say in mosque attacks as an example, that people were saying kia kaha, that we had aroha, that we were talking about Māori concepts for a source of comfort. But can they be a source of economy as well, Alex? Can, can, we, can we not have to compromise with utilising and uh, utilising Matauranga Māori and having economic outputs? Uh, Are they mutually exclusive? No, no way. No way whatsoever. Matauranga Māori, as, as Crucial mentioned before, it crosses across every silo that the Western society has created from your physical, emotional, financial, political, everything. It cuts across, which is the beauty of it. These things encompass... Science, whakapapa, the environment, how to share, how to make profit and stuff. The fact is, is even if you were to build an economy, the amount of references you have, historical reference from American whalers who said that Māori were the original traders of the Pacific. They could make money 
in a society where we didn't have make you know where they could trade with everything and there are stories of trade throughout the entire of the Pacific around the, the you know and that's the wider Pacific you know up into the Americas and everything else and to challenge that thought that they're mutually exclusive, I think, is is what we continually have to do and prove that theory. One of the wonderful things about Mātauranga and when we're talking about the economy or economics is that w- what we bring back, which is deeply needed, is the ethics. And if you think about the economy as just being one kind of relationship that we have with other people and other communities, you have a different perspective of all the range of relation, the ways in which we relate to other people and other communities and the economy just being one and maybe not always the most important one either. One of the things that I hear from both of you is it's about what we value, who we value and we know who tohunga are, we know what they bring. So part of that is recognising relationships and the mana of a person and a mana of their knowledge knowledge. So then it's about who gets to decide where mana lies. What work do we have to do there in terms of, say, in the COVID response, um, and we can look at iwi and how they did roadblocks, for instance, how do we reframe when an iwi, um, I guess, exercises mana motuhake or just utilises knowledge that they have, say in Tuhoi, that we've already been here, we've made sure that our people didn't die through another pandemic, and so this is why we're going to take this action. How do we reframe when people are, yeah, I guess don't give mana to that mātauranga Māori approach? The ultimate success, right, is to get them on your side of, of the argument, as opposed to just further polarise the corridor. And so for me it's about framing around, you talked about that, that treaty partnership, Actually, we're going to operate in partnership here because we know what's best to suit our people. We're not trying to come in over the law, which is what it was branded as. The fact that the law is standing, the physical embodiment of the law being the police is standing alongside us saying, yes, great, we need your help and we need your understanding and we need you to help us connect because we're just perceived as the opposition all the time. So when we work together, I think that is a demonstration of treaty partnership. That's a genuine display of treaty partnership and everyone loves Māori dim. you know even Don Brash when he was challenging te reo and then he'd come across the word whānau and he unpacked it as a he, he himself unpacked it as a concept not even just a word for family. As a final question I know sometimes uh, tangata tiriti people who aren't Māori get nervous mm. about stepping into the space and they have great intentions they're good people and then they worry will I overstep when it comes to mātauranga Māori, uh, that's in terms of trying to speak te reo Māori or to engage with Māori. So are there any sort of quick tips you can give to help the people who realise that there is an opportunity for them to be more than a mini Englander and to embrace everything it is to be a New Zealander in 2020? What are your tips for those people? Um, so I, I would say... The key tip is to focus on building the right kinds of relationships and to not trying to rush things, which we often find people do. They get, you know, anxious and then start rushing or giving up. Again, it's that question of how do I do it on my own, which is the wrong one that we ask ourselves. It's who is already doing this, mahi, with communities? Who already has rich relationships with Māori scholars, Māori activists, Māori policymakers, practitioners, Māori communities? There's so many people out there already. What can I learn from them and how can I connect with those people and those groups? It's, it's seeing yourself as part of a network of, of opportunities already and being able to be um, comfortable enough to be vulnerable for a little while and to find a place that you already have in, in this network of people and um, and landscapes. Yeah, mine is almost bang on the same thing. In my mind, I, well, the first thing that came to my mind is a quick tip is find your bridge. And your bridge might be a human resource or some other type of resource around you. There's someone who is connected. And you're, there's only two degrees of separation in this country. You know somebody. Don't, don't try and pretend you don't. So to find your avenue in... And your avenue might be in the world of sport, it might be in reo, it might be in education, it might be just down at your local marae, it might be a nephew you have or a niece you have. Someone, Someone's connected somewhere and it's about just starting with something small. I was having a call with a lady from South Africa and she found about found someone talk, talking about te whare tūtaua and someone said, yeah, and all you've got to do is come along and you start on that journey yourself. 
and it'll be an open and inviting place. So you've just got to make a start, but just find that thing, the, the right relationship. Build the relationship, yeah. and a relationship starts by turning up. Yeah. Tēnā kōrua, thank you both for turning up for us today for this conversation that counts. Ngā kōrero, whaitake. Kia You've been listening to Conversations That Count, Ngā Kōrero Whaitake, brought to you by Massey University and The Spin-Off. Hosted by me, Stacey Morrison. Produced by Jane Yee and Matthew McCauley, with music by Grayson Gilmore. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.